what I'd like to do is take a look at a poetic and uh, surprisingly confusing little bit of, of Scripture that's tucked into what is probably the most famous teaching of Jesus, the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which we have in Matthew's Gospel from chapters 5 to 7. It's also in Luke, but we're going to be in the Matthew version. Uh, or as the great, uh, now deceased, but great Christian philosopher, uh, Dallas Willard called it the Discourse on the Hill. Because if you go there in Israel, it's not so much of a mount. It's kind of a little hill by the seaside. But nonetheless, and in this teaching of Jesus, he ranges across a whole bunch of subjects that, it, that largely are very practical. In fact, one of my daughters the other day asked me, Dad, what are you going to teach on Sunday? I said, well, I'm teaching something out of Matthew 6. And she says, oh, the uh, Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount. And she says, I love that because you can just read it and do it. And I was like, wow, Okay. Who's parenting this kid? She's doing great, you know, like one of those, shy, you know, parents, you know what I'm saying. One of those moments when you realize, like, something's working. Something's working. I'm not, I'm not utterly failing at this. So um, in this chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 22 and 23. So I want to read them and then kind of expand out from there. So Matthew 6, chapter, or chapter 6, verse 22, Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body, so... If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, I don't know about you. I get attracted to verses like this. They're very kind of mystical, very poetic. And you're like, wow, Jesus. And the, but if you stop and read this, the question that comes to my mind is, what are you saying? What are you, what are you talking about? Because the eye is not a lamp. It's an eye. Light does not go down into the body. It passes through the optical mechanism and in a very mysterious way travels the optic nerve and is received in our mind as images. Our body doesn't contain light or darkness in that sense. And what about people who lose their eyes because of uh, accidents or illness or some tragedy? Are they condemned? now to this inner darkness that Jesus is speaking about because they don't have their eyes? What is he talking about? What, what sort of sight is this? What sort of eye is this? What is this, this light? And when you look at the context, it becomes even more odd because the immediate surrounding context is talking about money. Right before it, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And right after, he says, uh, you cannot serve God and money. So what's going on? One preacher that I read, he said he thought it would be better if those verses weren't even in there because then you could just sandwich the two pieces of money together and it would be really easy to understand. Uh, hopefully he was joking, but I don't think that's the case. I think it's very purposeful what Jesus did. And in fact, if you zoom out, it's really situated right smack in the middle of the whole Sermon on the Mount. And I think it makes sense not only of the money piece, but of everything Jesus was saying in the Sermon on the Mount. It's in, a, in a sense, it's almost a guiding principle for it and as we'll see later, I believe it applies to everything we go through in life. Now, before I go further in 6, there is one further place in Matthew's gospel that sheds some light on this. And I want to look at it, and then we'll jump back over, and it's in Matthew 20. Now, in Matthew 20, Jesus is doing this uh, parable. And a parable is just a story. It's a fictional story meant to teach a point. It's a story meant to illustrate a principle or a truth, okay? And so Jesus tells this story, and what he's saying is there was this guy who was managing a vineyard. Scripture calls it the master of the house, which is odd language nowadays. He's the vineyard manager, the house manager. And like a good manager, he wants the vineyard to do well. That means you've got to have people working in there, growing a lot of grapes, making a lot of wine, producing well, having a successful vineyard. So what does he do? He gets up early, he goes out, and he finds people to work in the vineyard. He says, hey, I got a vineyard. Why don't you come work in it? I'll pay you a wage. Is the wage good? They agree. They go to work. But he doesn't stop there. He goes out. He starts early in the morning, and then he goes out mid-morning, mid-day, mid-afternoon, afternoon, evening, all day long. He's looking for people that aren't working, and he's saying, come, work in the vineyard. I'll pay you a wage. And they do that. And then at the end of the day, he pays them their wage. And the guys who were working all day long, they, get, they begrudge him because he pays everybody the same. And they're looking at the people who only worked an hour and they're saying, I worked all day and I'm getting the same money this guy's getting. That's not fair. 
That's not right. I deserve more. Me, me, me. And it's their greed. It's their greed. It's their jealousy that reveals what's going on. And in verse 15 of chapter 20, a lot of the translations have it as Jesus saying something like, um, do you begrudge my generosity? But literally what he says right there is, uh, is your eye evil because I'm generous? So what, what is he saying? That they have the evil eye, you know, the ojo or whatever? No. They, it, it's, not, it's a metaphor. The way that they're seeing things, the, it, the, the way they are receiving what's happening around them, it's revealing this greed in their heart. And that's why they're reacting the way they do. When they could react in a completely different way, they could say, you know, I woke up and I didn't have a job. I didn't have any money or I had less money. And now I've got a job. I got some money in my hand. I've got a network with some other guys that I'm working with. I met this vineyard manager guy who seems like he's on the ball and knows what he's doing. But no, the response instead is, I deserve more. It's me. It's not fair. It's what I want. Now, and Jesus is talking about that parable relating to the kingdom of God, and the last will be first, first will be last. But there's a, the principle out of that does kind of tie into what we see him saying earlier in Matthew in chapter 6. So in chapter 6, again, verse 22, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the light, then, if the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? The same sort of dynamic is going on here. And again, I, I, it makes sense certainly of the money passages and greed, but it expands out to all of the things Jesus is talking about. To have a healthy eye means to see things, not merely from the circumstances and your self-serving or what I desire or my plans, but to see things in the light of who God has revealed himself to be in his word and principally in the life of Christ. It's a different kind of, of seeing. It's a spiritual sort of understanding. And I want to be clear, I'm not talking about some secret knowledge or secret understanding. The Bible doesn't advocate that. And teachers who teach that way are usually misleading people. They're not pointing people to Jesus. They're pointing people to themselves. Listen to me because I have secret knowledge and things like that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that this, to have a healthy eye, you're seeing things in light of the revelation of who God is throughout all of Scripture and most importantly in the life of Christ. And it's informing how you're seeing what's going on. I'll give you a kind of a, maybe a silly example, but that can illustrate it a little bit. All illustrations have their limitation. Uh, uh, last week, I was out uh, doing some, some work and research in a cafe in Hungary. I don't have an office or anything, so I do all my work in cafes uh, or at the house. And so I was out at a cafe, and I was doing some work, and um, there was this table of ladies who were having a meeting, and they're having a good old time. It was all good, and I was sitting there doing my work, and the one lady, I overheard her, and this is what she said. She said, uh, she goes, she's, they're, they're laughing, and she says, I can't handle suspense. If I'm watching a suspenseful, sp- suspenseful movie, I pause it, I Google it, and if the character that I like dies, I turn it off. <laughs> See, there's, there's more of you. She says, uh, I, I just can't handle it 100%. I read the last chapter first. Hate that. 100% of the time, I Google the ending. I can't handle suspense. Now, as a side note, if this was you or your group of friends, I wasn't eavesdropping, okay? In Europe, when we speak, we keep our conversation to the volume of the people who are having the conversation. In America, when we speak, we speak so the whole restaurant can hear y'all. And that's not wrong. It's not wrong. It's just different. But it does mean that the preacher in the corner gets to hear all your stories. So there you go. Everybody's going to be whispering in the cafes now, you know. They're like... But at any rate, so it's a, simple, it's a silly thing, but let me draw the principle out of not, not handling suspense, not dealing with tension, not, not with a movie or a book. The point she made was funny. But, but we can draw that out into our lives. How many of us are that tension of our situation, the health problem that we're facing or have been dealing with or a family member is going through, the financial trouble or crisis that's looming, right? The relationships that are just, oh, you don't know what to do with them because they're so difficult and the tension of what you're trying to 
work through and you just want to get to the other side. And you want what you see would be right for you. It should be this way. But from a healthy standpoint, you could see that God too is in the tension. Even whether it's caused by some evil action or whether it's something God has brought to you divinely, maybe the tension and the trial, that the process of it is actually the thing that He's using to shape your life. Maybe the tension, the suspense is even more important than the outcome in what He's trying to… Maybe that's the tool that He's trying to use. And it's just one example of a different way of looking at the things that come to us, our sight. Of course, we experience things through smell and touch and, and sound as well, but you get the, the force of the, of the sight. It's how we're receiving the things that are happening to us. It's revealing what's going on down inside. It's revealing how we're seeing things and that we, we, we want to grow and this ability to have eyes that are healthy so that we can be full of light and not struggle with this darkness. In a large way, um, this has to do with putting first things first, with, with seeking the, the right things first. Um, C.S. Lewis made a great point. He talked about if you, if you seek the good life, and here in the West, that's a big thing for us, uh, if you seek the good life, you know, a good status, good financial situation, just kind of avoiding pain, avoiding discomfort, certainly avoiding death, uh, and you just want the good life. And if you make that your primary goal, you, you miss your purpose for living. That you can't get… Se- if you make secondary things, having nice things, being comfortable, whatever, if you make those secondary things your first thing, you lose everything. You can't get secondary things by making them first. You only get them if you make the first thing first. What does Scripture say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, right? That that's the focus. It's, it has a lot to do with how our, our perspective is with those things. And one of the ways that we can see this and, and associate with this most clearly is in, is in the life of Christ to see the things that He went through. Because I tell you when, you, when you watch how He dealt with discomfort and anxiety and despair and loss and all of these kinds of things, the lesson for it in our situation, it's a radically different way of dealing with things. The good life is a myth. It's a, it's a, it's a left, leftover thing from the enlightenment. It's a lie. Pain and discomfort and death are part of this world as it is now, not originally, and in the future they will be done away with, but as it is right now, they're part of the process. We have to be able to live and journey through these things. And Jesus is saying, you can do this and be full of light. You can do this and still be full of light. When we look at the life of Christ, we see him, we see that this is a man who is, was acquainted with, uh, with anxiety and the stress of what was around him, principally in the garden, right? However unique that situation is, nonetheless, stressed to the point of physically sweating blood. He knew despair and the loss of relationship and the loss of his circumstances. He knew the loss of friendships, betrayal. Judas is with him, who was there in the ministry, who had seen everything, dips the bread in the cup with him right before he leaves to betray him. Peter, right? If all these betray you, I will not his family even turning against him at times. He knew abandonment. You know, we see this in John's gospel. Jesus' mother and brothers and sisters come to try and get him. They think he's crazy. They think he was out of his mind. Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you saying all these things? Come back with us to Nazareth. And later in chapter 7, his brothers almost mockingly, hey, if you're really doing all of these things, Jesus, why don't you go up to Jerusalem and do them where all the people are? Why are you out here in the sticks in the middle of nowhere in Galilee? He knew abandonment. He was misunderstood. Who's this guy who's teaching and he doesn't have the degrees and the education? What's he doing? He's just around another false messiah. We'll strike him down and the sheep will scatter. He was rejected by those closest to them, refused opportunities. He was lied about, lied to. Again, 
He knew anxiety, despair, loss, betrayal, abandonment, misunderstood, rejected by those closest to him, refused opportunities, lied about, and lied to. He intimately knew all of those things. And it does not matter that that was 2,000 years ago. Humanity does not change. That's a lie. Humanity does not change. Technology changes. Circumstances change. Humanity does not change. We're not just getting better and better until we solve everything. Again, a leftover idol from the Enlightenment. It's not true. Yes, we're making great advances, and we do amazing things with technology, certainly in areas of medicine and helping with ed- education and relief of poverty. We're doing incredible things, but have you noticed the more advanced we get, advanced, the the more creative ways we find to be cruel? It's because of who we are does not change. Go read the ancient literature. You can find it for free on the internet. Go read the ancient literature. Read the old epics. Read the ancient philosophies. Read the old myths. Go read Job in Scripture, which is most likely the oldest in terms of the time when it was written, the oldest piece of literature in the Bible. What you'll find is the relationships and the characters in there, it's the same knuckle-headed friends that you have, and people are making the same dumb mistakes that you and I make. Humanity does not change. And so it doesn't matter that Jesus didn't have an iPhone, and He doesn't know what your job was like, and He doesn't know about your friends. That's nonsense. That's an excuse. Humanity is humanity. He's intimately acquainted. He bore our sorrows, Isaiah says, and He did. He knows. He knows. So when you're dealing with those things, know that He understands perfectly the darkest part of what you go through. He knows it. He knows the heights of your greatest joys. Not only did He personally live them, He was with you when you went through them, whether you realize it or not. That's, you find this example in Christ of how he's living through these things. And those are not the only things that Jesus knew, by the way. He also knew a great and unbreakable love for his Father in heaven. I do nothing of my own, but only what the Father commands me. As I see the Father working, that's what I do. And an unbreakable love for the people who, as God, he brought into existence an unshakable love for people. And if you look and read the end of of John 17, an unbreakable love for you, for you personally and for me. As he prays for the disciples and then he prays for those who will believe believe in him through their message. That's me. That's you. That's every generation of believers. Jesus also knew this great and unshakable love. So great was the light in him. He's called the light of the world, John says. So we don't focus on the good life and per- second things first. We don't focus on me and my greed and what I need and what it needs to be. We take in our situations through the lens that God has revealed Himself to us in the greatest of all possible ways. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I love thinking of, of this, that, you know, of all of the ways, you know, God could have revealed Himself, I suppose, in, in other ways besides in the person of Christ. And, and of course, He has generally in creation and in Scripture. But what God did, and, and if He does really have perfect knowledge and perfect strength and perfect wisdom, right, meaning He knows all the information, He knows the absolutely right thing to do with the information, and He has all the ability to do the absolutely right thing and no one can stop Him, then coming as Christ was the best of all possible ways for Him to reveal Himself. And as He comes to us, what does He come to us as? As the thing we know best, a human. He doesn't come as some other being different than us that we wouldn't have understood. He reveals Himself in Christ as a human, the thing we know best. And sadly, we don't know ourselves all that well, uh, but nonetheless, the thing we know best, what it means to be human That's how Jesus comes, so that we might see Him as clearly as possible. And that is the starting point, because there's no point in moving towards uh, a better, healthier I, and there's no point in seeking by God's help to live more full of light through your circumstances and seeing God in your circumstances until you have first laid down your arms and surrendered to Christ 
as who He declared Himself to be as Savior, as one who saves. And one who saves is one who saves from. You don't need a Savior until you know that you need saving from something. And that saving from is God's good and right and just judgment against evil. It's the wrath of God that Jesus saves us from. And forget all the Hitlers of the world. Forget all the I'm better than most of the people I know. Just look at the last week of your life or, and, I, and my life as well. I'm on the stage, but I'm just as messed up as anybody else, probably more than most of you. And look at the last week of our lives when you gave vent to your anger, when you gave vent to your lust, to your jealousy, when you put your pride before the care of other people, when you said those things about the person that you knew weren't right and you knew shouldn't have been said, when your vindictiveness was all the the control of your heart, when you were doing what you shouldn't have done or not doing the things you should have done, you see, it's, it's the, it's, this evil is very simple and it's very intimate to each and every one of us, myself included. And in these evils, we build up for ourselves the wrath of God. We want a God who judges what's wrong, right? When somebody wrongs you or wrongs someone, you're like, God, someone's got to judge that. He's going to. And He has in Christ for those who trust Him. That's why He gave His life, to step into that place and take the wrath of God for you, for me. So now freely we may come to Christ. And as the Scripture says, you will not endure the wrath of God. Whatever other nonsense and hardship we endure, just like non-believers in this world because it's messed up, we still go through that stuff, but you won't go through the wrath of God. And that's the worst of all of it because Jesus takes that. And that's the starting point, to recognize there is only one way. There is one God and one Redeemer, and besides Him, there is no other. For all the religions and stories of myths of the world, whatever truths they may contain, and most of them have some truths, they're incomplete. They're echoes, shadows, signposts to Jesus, the one true revelation, full revelation of God in flesh. And when you trust Him, you come to new life now, eternal life hereafter, and then you're in a place for Him to work with you so that we can take your eye from being darkened and unhealthy to being healthy. And you begin to see things in a way, you begin to give room in these terrible things you're going through, you give room for God to be there. Or, no, I shouldn't say it that way, God is there. You, give, you find room in your heart and your mind to recognize that He is there. He's already there ahead of you. And in the great things that happen to you, you rejoice and bless God and take no pride in it, knowing that He freely gives all good things to us as he is the father of lights. That's the beginning. And so my hope is that for me and for you, we would desire the life that we see in Jesus, this life that is full of light, that in all circumstances he could stay faithful, faithful and joyful, even in tears, whether laughing and rejoicing with friends and family or whether dealing with the anger and bitterness that comes from rejection and betrayal, that we could live full of light. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for your life. That you came, you did come to us. That in history, you stepped onto the stage. And in your word, yes, you've revealed and kept everything for us. But the life that you lived, Lord, you called us to you. You desire each and every one of us not only to know you and have eternal life, but to grow in that every single day onward, perfected, and then to live with you in eternity. What amazing things you've done. What what greater story is there? There is no greater story. There's no greater epic that could be told. And so, Lord, I pray you bless me and everyone here. Help us, Lord, to like you, Have eyes that are healthier so that like you, we may live full of light. And like you, we may be instruments to show people the Father that more and more people would know your peace and your hope. In your great name, amen.